All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Explore Massachusetts Off the Beaten Path. Uh, author Maria Alia, um, no, I got that wrong. Uh, 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 Maria, we even practiced this. Maria, oh, how am I pronouncing it? Olia. Olia. I want to say Alia. That doesn't sound right. So Olia, Maria Olia, uh, will discuss her brand new book, Massachusetts Off the Beaten Path. So we're going to discover some of Massachusetts' unique offerings uh, with this guide. We're going to, uh, the, in, in the book, you visit a, a wooden boat shop that has uh, been in business since 1793. You admire the pressed glass galleries at the Sandwich Glass Museum. Uh, and you can travel back uh, in time at the 19th century Old Sturbridge Village. So Maria uh, here is a travel writer and essayist. She has written extensively about Boston and New England and has authored several travel books on the region. Her articles and essays have appeared in the Boston Globe, in uh, Working Mother, and in the Christian Science Monitor, among several other publications. Uh, Maria has lived in, Boston, in the Boston area since arriving as a college student to study at Northeastern University more than 30 years ago. She resides with her husband in Newton, just outside of Boston, where they raised their three sons and daughter. Maria has a passion for American history, Cape Cod beaches, the Boston Symphony, and the Red Sox. How about those Red Sox, Maria? I really liked that uh, doubleheader sweep a couple days ago. The I Yankees. know, that was uh, amazing. And uh, Maria will always call Massachusetts home. So again, thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring uh, all 200 or so who are watching live wow. and the many more that will watch on demand. Let's give Maria a big virtual round of applause for joining us this evening. And Maria, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, thank you, Robert. Um, hello, hello to everyone. Um, so many people, so many places um, throughout Massachusetts and really across the country. I'm, I'm just... I'm really pleased to be with you tonight. Um, many thanks also to the Tewksbury Library for reaching out to me to uh, ask me to speak about this, my latest book. Uh, this is it. It's newly published. It came out just on May 1st. Um, this is actually my seventh travel book. I've written about Boston, New England, and Mass Massachusetts exclusively. And um, I wanted to start tonight by telling you a little bit about the background of the book. The series actually uh, was first published in the 1990s. As you can imagine, there's one for each state. Um, the most recent Massachusetts version was published in 2007. Uh, it was well-written um, and that was 16 years ago. And when you think about 16 years in the travel writing world, it's like, it's like ancient history. Um, if you think about it, uh, uh, Uber and Lyft were not invented, and uh, farm-to-table dining was hardly a thing. The seaport in Boston, it didn't exist. Well, it, it did exist, of course, but it didn't exist the way it does now um, with all the, the shops and the, the fancy restaurants. Um, the series was relaunched, uh, actually, in response to COVID. I think because of the pandemic, a lot of us stayed close to home. And we realized that there were a lot of places to see right in our own backyard. Um, it's a travel trend that's continued even, um, even in the post-pandemic travel, um, travel world. Um, as the title makes clear, I think the book is all about what is special, unusual, and unexpected in the state. Which brings me to the most um, common question people ask me actually is, how did you decide what was off the beaten path? What is off the beaten path in Massachusetts? Uh, I was very lucky. I've been working with my editor for more than a decade and uh, she gave me free reign to decide myself. Um, and when I thought about it, or when you think about it, uh, off the beaten path is really something that's very, uh, is relative. Um, I think about, for example, uh, a young couple that might be coming to Boston for a romantic weekend getaway, and maybe one of them had gone to school here. Um, for them, maybe off the beaten path means going to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum instead of the MFA. Uh, I think about a family from Missouri who might be coming to the East Coast to, um, you know, march their kids down the Freedom Trail to show them the Revolutionary War sites. 
So for that family, going off the beaten path might mean going to the Franklin Park Zoo instead of joining the big crowd at the New England Aquarium on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, I can see through um, the chat that most of us are from Massachusetts. Um, so for Massachusetts residents, residents and natives, off the beaten path is something uh, altogether different. I think many, many of us think that we do know Boston and that we know it quite well. But how many of you have actually, for example, gone to the Longfellow House Washington headquarters, which is it's in, it's in Cambridge, and it's right outside of Harvard Square. It's on Brattle Street. It's a big yellow house. Uh, I've actually been on Brattle Street going to my car, and I literally have seen National Park Service rangers with their hats standing on the sidewalk, encouraging people to come on inside. This is off the beaten path. I mean, it's right in the middle of, of Cambridge, but hardly anybody ever sees it. Uh, so that's a great example of what this book will um, is all about. Um, another really good example is the Shaylin Lu uh, Performing Center and Performance Center in Rockport. You know, it opened in 2010. A lot of fanfare. I mean, it was a, it's a wonderful idea to see a classical music concert against the backdrop of the, the waves cross, you know, crashing on those rocks. Um, but have you actually gone? Have you actually done it? So this book is about doing those things. Um, so sometimes off the beaten path is the places that you haven't been to yet, um, but, some, but they're located right next door. Um, so tonight I wanted to read what I consider some of the best bits from the book. Um, and I think we're going to go on a little, a little trip through the, through the state tonight. So the first one that I wanted to read about is the Saugus Ironworks, which is located just about 10 miles north of, of Boston. It's another National um, Park Service site, um, and it is also not well, um, uh, well visited. So I wanted to read a section of the book. So forgive me bending my head. Um, I haven't memorized this. Um, so here we go. Uh, the importance of the Saugus Ironworks in shaping early American industry cannot be overestimated. Originally named Hammersmith, the foundry can trace its roots to the 1640s. At the time, iron was necessary for many finished goods, nails for houses and boats, wagon wheels, plows, and kettles. It was worth more than gold. It could only be imported from England. Massachusetts Bay Governor John Winthrop saw the need for the fledging colony to be self-sufficient. Hammersmith was established on the banks of the Saugus River, which provided water for the sophisticated system of hydraulics that drove the wheels to run the machinery. The manufacturing success enriched the colony, helping it become independent from England and laying the foundation of America's iron and steel industry. The 12-acre industrial site a historically accurate recreation of the Puritan era operation features a forge, paddle wheels, a rolling mill, a warehouse, and a blacksmith's black shop. There's also a short nature trail through the very same forest that once fed the blast furnaces insatiable need for fire. So um, that is an example of something that um, you didn't even know existed probably. But the book also um, offers perspectives on things that you know very, very well. So for that example, I want to go to the North End. And I'm sure you've been to the North End if you've ever been to Boston. Um, for people who live here, we may even avoid it, uh, thinking that it is too touristy. I personally think it's a wonderful place to bring visitors. And I actually did so just last week. We had visitors, friends and family from the UK and we went to the North End and we did several things that I'm going to read about today. So it's a sidebar in this book and it's called Foodie Neighborhood, the North End. And I also did Foodie Neighborhood, Chinatown, but tonight I'm gonna to read the North End. Um, so here we go. The first Italian immigrants came to the North End in the late 1800s. With its narrow streets, red brick tenements, and the smell of garlic in the air, the neighborhood still has a movie set quality about it. Choosing among the nearly 100 restaurants packed into the North End can be hard. So here's a list of some of my, some of my favorites. 
Uh, a classic oyster bar is a fine place for a quick stop at any time of the day or night. Inevitably, there is a line out the door at Neptune Oyster, located at 63 Salem Street. The mirrored zinc bar is a buzzy backdrop to the hum of conversation punctuated by laughter. Diners sit elbow to elbow, sipping wine and slurping the briny goodness of freshly shucked oysters. This is where the cool kids hang. And when I was there two weeks ago, there was still a line at the door. Um, just down the street, Andico Forno is an absolute staple in the neighborhood for its pizza, top-notch pastas, and simple, honest dishes like braised pork shank with polenta. Antico Forno means ancient oven. The brick wood-fired hearth reaches 700 degrees, achieving pizza with a crispy crust that still has a good chew. It also turns out lovely baked pastas. The marvelously cheesy baked rigatoni and sausage is a menu mainstay. Located at 290 Hanover Street, the first Italian cafe in the neighborhood opened in 1929 and was a natural gathering place for the neighborhood's Italian immigrants. With its cozy bistro tables, marble floors, and copper tin ceiling, it's hard not to fall in love with Cafe Victoria. It's a wonderful spot to take a break and relax with a coffee and cannoli. In the evening, it is a perfect perch for a night for night owls in search of a nightcap, as is open until midnight every day and has a full liquor license. Order our Cafe Correcto or Correct Coffee, and your espresso will come with a splash of alcohol, usually Sambuca. Um, located at 257 Hanover Street, modern pastry may be borderline touristy, but it is a legendary Italian-American bakery that has been around for more than 80 years. Your hunt for the perfect North End cannoli ends here. Modern fills each tender cannoli shell with perfectly balanced, not too sweet ricotta to order. It's hard to understand why more people don't know that there's a restaurant under modern pastry, but it is a secret that should definitely get out, especially when all the restaurants on Hanover Street are overflowing. Walk down the, st the stairs next door at 263 Hanover Street to Modern Underground, a speakeasy style space, space where there's an Italian soccer match playing silently on the TV above the bar. Take your pick from Italian American dishes such as chicken parm, ravioli with vodka sauce and Caesar salad, or channel Frank Sinatra and order a martini. Note, modern pastry is cash only, but modern underground accepts credit cards. Sala Maria Italiana has been a neighborhood anchor since 1962. Expat Italians and tourists alike are drawn by the shop's high quality Italian ingredients. Find extra virgin olive oils, hard to find pantry staples like salt packed anchovies and aged balsamic vinegar so thick that you can spread it on bread. Those in the know come for the made to order porchetta and caprese sandwiches to eat at the Greenway picnic tables. Grab a number at the deli counter and brace for a wait, but the people watching is great and there are always generous samples of salami and cheese to be had. Um, so reading about the North End um, reminds me of a dilemma that came early on in the writing of the book, which was whether I should include the Freedom Trail, um, which is the least off the beaten uh, path activity that you possibly could do in Boston. It's, it's our most popular tourist attraction. Um, in the end, I decided to add it. Um, I was thinking about um, going to Washington DC and not talking about the memorials that line the National Mall. I think it was necessary to put it in the book if only for context. Um, it's a sidebar in the book. I'm not gonna read that section, um, but what I do is I recommend that readers start from Charlestown. They start, especially if they want to go up the Bunker Hill Monument, start with that first, your legs will be fresh. Then go to the, the, uh, the Constitution. Again, if you're going earlier in the day, you're going to miss all the other people. And it'll be quicker to go through the, the security lines that you'll have to go through to, to see that site. And um, then I recommend instead of Faneuil Hall, which is a really um, you know, very typical place to stop to eat. You could you could stop instead of the uh, Boston Public Market. But what I suggest is you really you start from the, the um, from the end of it and you work your way back. Um, and so, as for the general structure of the book, you know, in Massachusetts, it's pretty obvious um, how the chapters are going to be laid out. So, of course, we do we do Boston, and I do the North Shore, and then the South Shore, 
uh, the Cape Cod and the islands. You know, when you write a book about Massachusetts, Cape Cod and the islands is the second most popular chapter. Uh, Worcester, uh, the Pioneer Valley, and then finally the Berkshires. Um, so what I wanted to do was read a little bit about Worcester. I wanted to read the intro to Worcester. Um, as you see, as you can see when I read this, this book is really for people who, uh, who like history. Uh, my mom and dad are actually from Worcester, so I'm, I'm extremely familiar uh, with the city. So we'll read that one. Uh, here we go. So uh, just 45 miles from Boston, New England's second largest city is often overlooked. This is where we're gonna talk about my love of the Red Sox. Uh, in the late 1800s, Worcester was an industrial boom town, manufacturing goods as diverse as machine tools, wire, and power loops. Factory work declined in the second half of the 20th century and post-manufacturing boom took over. Fast forward to the present and Worcester's on the rise. The city is home to nine colleges and universities, including Holy Cross, Worcester, Worcester Polytech, and the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Of late, downtown has been raised and rebuilt. Much of the Renaissance has been powered by the Boston Red Sox. The Sox AAA team relocated to Worcester in 2021, fueling development of the city's canal district with a new stadium, hotels, and trendy eateries. There's no doubt that the Worcester Red Sox, affectionately known as the Woo Sox, has been a total home run for the city. In the why have I not heard this before category, Worcester's, Worcester is tops. The first public reading of the Declaration of Independence didn't take place in Boston. It happened in Worcester on the steps of South Church on July 24th, 1776. The first American made mass produced Valentine's Day cards were manufactured by Worcester's Esther Howland. And the iconic yellow smiley face that is the city's unofficial emblem is thanks to Harvey Ball, a local graphic designer and ad man who invented the symbol to boost employee morale for an insurance company. You can take a deep dive into these Worcester firsts and many more at the Worcester Historic Museum. And so the Worcester Historic Museum is one of what I consider the top 10 um, attractions in Worcester. Um, so each chapter has my top 10 picks. So for Worcester, that would be the Blackstone River and Canal Heritage Park, Fruitlands, uh, the Museum of, Ru of Russian Icons in Clinton, the New England Botanic Garden at Tower Hill, which is in Boylston, Old Sturbridge Village, Polar Park, which is the stadium for the Woo Sox, Purgatory Chasm State Reservation, Wachusett Mountain State Reservation for hiking and for skiing, the Worcester Historical Museum, which I just mentioned, and the Worcester Public Market, which is brand new. It's, it's kind of like Faneuil Hall uh, in Worcester. Um, and then throughout the book, there are fun sidebars. And I wanted to read a few of my favorites. Um, if I were going to Nantucket uh, this summer, I would uh, check this site out. Uh, the little trivia says, gentle, kind, and true are the words on an icon style painting of a smiling Fred Rogers in one of his trademark cardigans in St. Paul's Episcopal Church. Fred Rogers, the beloved host of Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, summered in Nantucket from the early 1960s until his passing in 2003. He was a summer parishioner at St. Paul's and the painting is displayed on the wall next to his favorite pew. St. Paul's is an active congregation but visitors are welcome to pop in to see the portrait. Um, also on the cake, I'd like to talk about wampum. Um, after bar bartering, the use of wampum, beads made from quahog shells in a dizzying array of white, blue, and purple hues. It was the go-to method of payment among the native tribes of the East Coast. As early as the 1630s, the colonies at Jamestown, New Amsterdam, and Plymouth accepted wampum for trade with native tribes as well as among one another to replace coinage, coinage which was scarce in the colonies. Wampum is considered Massachusetts' first currency. It was recognized by the Massachusetts Bay Colony as legal tender in 1650 and was the de facto coin of the realm for the next 30 years. And then I wanted to move north to. Uh, the Lowell area, 
and we can read about the art of James McNeil Whistler. Actually, this isn't, this isn't a trivia, this is a sidebar. Fun fact, the painter James McNeil Whistler was born in Lowell in 1834. Whistler's most famous work is Arrangement in Gray and Blue, number one, the painting better known as Whistler's Mother. Whistler's mother did indeed sit for the portrait. The painting was the first work by an American artist that was purchased by France. And it was originally displayed in the Louvre and it now makes its home at Paris Musée d'Orsay. The Whistler House Museum of Art is the home of the Lowell Art Association, which lovingly maintains the birthplace of one of their own while promoting the work of the next generation of Lowell artists through special exhibits. The museum has a very good reproduction of Whistler's mother to view and a gallery of Whistler's etchings as well as sketches by John Singer Sargent as, as Whistler and Sargent were friends. Um, also be sure to check out the stunning bronze sculpture of Whistler in the little park across the street by Tewksbury artist, Miko Kaufman. Um, so um, besides the, the, the um, there are also throughout the book listings of places to eat and places to stay, and nearly all of them are independently owned or um, and local. Um, so, uh, off the beaten path is really it's a book for someone who's probably familiar with the state. Um, it's a I think it's a great book to stash in your glove compartment uh, for when you are out and about. Um, for me, it's a it's an invitation to explore the sites that you've been meaning to visit but you haven't you haven't visited yet. Um, so I wanted to give an example uh, of my own. Um, I was speaking with my husband and I was saying how um, I really wanted to go to the Frederick Law Olmsted uh, site, uh, which is in Brookline, which is about three miles from my home, and I'd never been, and I wanted to explore it for this book. Um, you know, you probably know Olmsted designed Central Park and he's considered America's first uh, landscape architect. Uh, he also designed the Emerald Necklace in Boston, uh, most notably uh, Franklin Park and the Jamaica, uh, the Jamaica Pond Riverway. So his home and his office um, are uh, located behind the Brookline Reservoir. So as my husband and I were driving over there, he stopped and he says, I go by this all the time. I go on the street all the time and I've never noticed it. Um, he says, I go on the street because I'm trying to avoid the traffic going into the city. So this book is about those kind of places. Um, a lot of times people ask me what my favorite off the beaten path go-to uh, thing is. For me, um, a, a really good combination is the Mount Auburn Cemetery, cemetery in, um, in Watertown. Um, it's a garden cemetery and it's it's styled um, like Paris's um, Père Lachaise. It's also an arboretum. It's a wonderful place to take uh, a long walk uh, through the paths. Uh, many famous Bostonians are, um, are there, they're residents. So that would be, for example, Longfellow. Uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner is there as well. Um, and there's also a, a tower that you can climb, a 90 foot tower, it's called Washington's Tower, and you have a great view of, of Boston. And after that, I would go across the street and there's this wonderful restaurant, it's called Sofra. Uh, I think in 2022, it was named in the New York Times as one of America's best restaurants. It, um, it specializes in Middle East food. Um, I'm very partial to the spinach falafel. There's a chocolate hazelnut baklava. So that to me is a great, um, a great example of what uh, Off the Beaten Path is all about. Uh, another example of that kind of situation would be if I were on, um, if I were on the vineyard, uh, an Off the Beaten Path kind of thing that I would like, that I like to do with my friends and my family. Um, if I'm in Edgar Town, uh, rent a bicycle, uh, go to Among the Flowers, get, uh, have them pack a lunch to go, and then ch take the Chappaquiddick Ferry um, over to Chappaquiddick, um, and then go to My Toy. My Toy is a, um, is a uh, Trustees of Reservations property, and uh, they have picnic benches there to enjoy that lunch. And then after lunch, just right outside of My Toy, there's a little beach, it's Leyland State Reservation, 
and then you can go to the beach and then you take the ferry back and you're back in, in the vineyard. So that's an example, again, of an off the beaten path um, uh, excursion that is very doable and that you can learn about in the book. Um, I think for us in Massachusetts, we're so lucky um, to call Massachusetts home. There's, there's so many things to do. Um, and I think there are many, many wonderful ideas of places that you can go um, this summer. Uh, so um, any, any questions? So Maria, I'm gonna pop back up here. Uh, so Maria, I guess my first question is, before we get to the audience questions, is, um, and you, you briefly touched on this at the beginning, but uh, what qualifies something as off the beaten path? Um, you know, I, I, I guess that you, you, know, you referenced the Freedom Trail, which everyone knows, but uh, I, I understand it made it into your book. But do you, do you have like a definition of, uh, of off the beaten path? I don't have a definition per se, but there's off the beaten path. And then there are things that are so off the beaten path that people don't really want to do them. This is not that kind of book. There are books out there that find the most obscure things to do. There's a great example of that. There's, I think it's called Pony Hudge in, in Lincoln. And um, people have decided to deposit their used rocking horses in a circle. And it's interesting, but I don't know if my book is about um, directing people to Pony Hedge. So if I was talking about Lincoln, you know, I think uh, a better use of anybody's time would be perhaps to go to Gropius House. He was the, um, the Bauhaus um, architect and his home is there. And it's a great example of modern architecture. It also is a trustees of reservations um, property. Um, and the thing is, as I was talking, you might've heard me say trustees of reservations and National Park Service. And then there's one more, it's um, a New England, um, uh, well, those two in particular, I would say are really stewards of the things that are off the beaten path. Um, and the thing that I, I perhaps haven't spoken enough about right now is that since COVID, we've all been more interested in doing things that are outside. So in this book, there are a lot of um, short hikes or um, kayak paddles that people can do um, as they travel throughout the state. And one of those examples was I just mentioned very briefly was the purgatory chasm. A lot of people discovered that during um, COVID because it's a great thing to do to, to social, socially distance yourself. Yeah, just a comment. It was nice that you referenced uh, at least a few um, of the National Historic uh, Sites uh, and Parks uh, in, in your book. We just did a series here in Tewksbury, a, a weekly series that uh, we, we Zoomed with a lot of the park rangers at those parks and, and sites. And uh, we got to almost all of them. Uh, there were a few like the Boston Harbor Islands that uh, don't do virtual programs, but we got to most of them. Uh, and I think the uh, the third organization you might have been thinking of is Historic New England. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, and uh, we've done some uh, Zoom programming with them as well. All right, so let's jump into some audience questions. Um, uh, these are both comments and questions. Sure. Uh, so Janet says that uh, Fruitlands uh, in Harvard with four museums and a lovely lunchroom uh, reserved for lunch before seeing two museums and then see the other two after lunch. So that's a recommendation from Janet. Have you been to the Fruitlands before, um, Maria? Yes, and um, the other thing about Fruitlands is they have a they have um, robust programming for the winter. You know, we're right now in June, and we're all thinking about summer travel. But they have programming in the winter, which includes renting snowshoes um, along the you know throughout the property, and that's another good thing to remember. The book is not just for the summer; it's also for uh, the other times of the year. By the way, and, and I apologize if you mentioned this at the beginning, but how many um, locations and attractions do you include in your book? Oh, I don't know. I'm sure several hundred. Right. More than you could, more than you could possibly visit um, in in probably a lifetime, and it's taken me almost a lifetime to see these sites as well. I, I'll give you an example. You know, as I mentioned, I've been writing these books for decades, and when I started this particular book, I said, "Where where do I want to revisit? Where hadn't I been for a while?" Um, and that place was Cape Ann, actually. So I actually just this year for the very first time. Um, this is the Cape Ann Museum. 
And I was amazed. It's again, it's one of those places where you've heard about, you've probably heard about the Fitzhenry Lane paintings. And I went and I was blown away. You could easily do this in an hour. And then, you know, you know about the, the paintings and then you, you discover something else. So the something else there was the Folly Cove Artists, Artisan Guild, um, which was a group of mostly women artists in the 1940s, 1950s. I think they were led by Virginia Lee Burton who wrote um, uh, Mike Mulligan and Steam Shovel. And it was unusual at the time, right? They were women artists and they were making money doing their work. And that's another permanent, permanent exhibit that's there. Now, I go up to the North Shore, I might go to the beach and I think, oh, I'm gonna to go to the KB Museum and I've never done it. Um, so this is the kind of thing I wanna encourage people to do. Uh, Francis asks, did any art museums get included in your book? And RJ specifically asks about the Worcester Art Museum, which is often an overlooked but world-class museum. Yes, the Worcester Art Museum is in the book. Um, it is overlooked, especially for those Roman mosaics, which are really world famous. It might be the most important thing that's in that particular museum. Um, the Worcester Art Museum also um, took on um, the Armory Museum in Worcester's collection. So that, um, that museum closed um, prior to COVID. And so all the things from that museum now are in the Worcester Art Museum. So it's an interesting thing to see. So uh, Lois wants to know if you uh, had to go to the Berkshires for a weekend, uh, what are some of the uh, off the beaten path uh, uh, lo uh, locales and attractions to do there? That actually was the other place that I kind of revisited for this book. And I went in the winter specifically because the Berkshires are, they're trying to promote not just the summer festival season, which is um, largely um, spearheaded by the Boston Symphony Orchestra, but they're trying to promote their winter sports. Um, so I went to Jiminy Peak. Um, and again, when you think about skiing in New England, you're always thinking about New Hampshire or Vermont. And we went shortly after Christmas and it was magical. Um, but in terms of things to see there, um, Again, I went to the Norman Rockwell Museum. I had not been for 10 years and it was wonderful to just revisit, um, you know, what is really an important part of, uh, of American art. Uh, an anonymous attendee writes, and this wasn't me, I swear, uh, are uh, libraries included in your book? Did you have any libraries as off the beaten path places? Well, the Boston Public Library, of course, is in the book. It's one of my favorite places in Boston. Um, it's important uh, architecturally. It's important historically. Um, they also have a, a marvelous restaurant where you can have afternoon tea. So that is that is one of the libraries that is in the book. Uh, Jarek asks, what is one of your favorite off the beaten path excursions that you've done? My favorite favorite um recently um boy that would be a tough one um well i would say um on this last trip to uh to the north shore to cape ann uh we went to hammond castle i'd never been to that um very interesting um in terms of its design and in terms of its history, uh, you know, kind of a uh, quirky industrialist putting his money into this uh, fantasy uh, fortress. Um, and I, I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, so Annabelle asks, uh, what national parks uh, do you recommend in Massachusetts? And I guess it kind of depends on how you count them. But I think there are 16 National Historic Park uh, units in Massachusetts. Maria, do you have a favorite? Um, the national parks that are Georgia's Island. I think that's very underrated. Uh, a lot of people take the ferries from uh, Boston, the national um, from, from the Boston Harbor, but you can also take a tour of the lighthouses, and that is exclusive to the National Park Service. They run them only on the weekends, only during the season. I think it's from you know May to September, um, and there are only a couple of, of boats 
you know, on Saturday and on Sunday, but that's really a wonderful tour. You don't get to actually go in the lighthouses, but you're on, on the boats. You get the knowledge of the National Park Service Rangers, which is always phenomenal, and you get really close to them. So I think that's a really interesting tour. Uh, Grace says that I'm particularly interested in Asian American or Chinese American historic sites. Are there any that you would recommend? Wow. I cannot give a recommendation, and that just speaks to, you know, a need here in, in Massachusetts. All right, we, we finally stumped her, folks. I know. Yeah, I, I have think, to write uh, that down. But, you know, I would say, you know, I do make an effort to include everybody and everything. Um, and in this particular book, I made much more of an effort to include Native people. And that's very different from any other book that I've, uh, that I've ever written. I mean, part of practically every introduction is about the Native people that were there first. Yeah, I know that like uh, the PB, and this doesn't really answer the question, but I know like the Museum of Fine Arts and the Peabody Essex Museum, they'll have, um, you know, exhibits or galleries uh, for Asian uh, art. But, um, and I think there's an Asian art gallery nearby in Chelmsford, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know anymore myself, so I do apologize. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, uh, any thoughts on the Hancock Shaker Village? The, the, it, the time to visit the Hancock uh, Shaker Village is certainly in the spring when all the baby uh, animals are there. Uh, Beverly wants to know, have you visited the Fuller Craft Museum in Brockton? Yes, I have. And that is absolutely in the book. Uh, RJ is a fan of the garden at Elm Bank. Oh, yes. That, that's, that's just a few miles from my home. 15 miles away. Yes. Definitely underrated. Uh, Jean says, uh, your recommendations are wonderful. Uh, can you name um, other... Um, even more off the beaten tracks, maybe some that involve nature. Do you have any hidden gems in nature that you would recommend, Maria? Off the top of my head, um, hidden gems. Rodley um, Park up on the North Shore. I think that's um, not, I think only locals know about that. Yeah, great. Grace notes that if you uh, do come across attractions uh, for you know, Asian American history to include them in future books. That's a and great she, idea. She says, thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee says, says the Yin Yu Tang house at the Peabody Essex Museum is a great take. Yes. Uh, so there we um, go. That, that is in the book. It's not that I totally ignore, you know, Asian art. And that certainly is in the book. But that um, to me is an obvious. It, it is very obvious. Um, but again, it's all relative. So I'm going to jump over to the chat now, Maria, where we have okay. lots of comments and questions. Um, Jay says that uh, their favorite summer place to visit is Nantucket. Yeah. Uh, Peter um, was wondering if Robert Goddard was born in Worcester and that there might be a space museum in Worcester. Are you familiar with that, Maria? No, I, I don't think so. Not yet. Okay. Uh, Jay notes that uh, they lived in uh, Brookline um, uh, on Beale Street, which uh, across from the old Kennedy. Kennedy family home. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Again, that's another national park site um, that people know about, um, but they don't go to. You know, one of the things I noticed post COVID with the national park sites, their uh, seasons has gotten shorter. Mm -hmm. And the, the number of hours has also gotten shorter. So you really, you definitely have to check. But some of these places, like I know the um, the Kennedy uh, birthplace, it used to be open April through October every day. And now it's kind of like May through September and on the weekend. So that's certainly something that needs to be checked, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't go. Uh, Maria, a couple of questions ago, I asked you for a hidden gem in nature. Can you just repeat the location you gave? Um, in Newburyport, Maud Lake Park. Got it. Okay. We had a couple of folks asking about that. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh boy. We're not going to get to all of these. Uh, Louise uh, just wanted you to know that Medford just recently had the slave wall, which was bequeathed to the city and recently restored as a community preservation project. 
It is beautiful and it is located on Grove Street. So, so that I might have, be. Yeah, I have the Royal House in Medford in the book. It's the one site in Medford and I, that is in the book. Medford, by the way, has a beautiful new uh, library. Uh, you might want to take a look at that one, uh, Maria. Uh, Anne said, uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, donated and uh, made it, uh, basically helped build it. Um, Anne says the new there's a new innovation trail uh, from Cambridge to Boston, I think she's saying. You might want to check that out. Yeah. Uh, Mar Margaret notes that Harvard University has a number of museums. And mm -hmm. on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings, uh, museum admission is free to all Massachusetts residents. Uh, these are excellent museums that are even great for children. And on Sundays are great as you can park on the streets without a resident sticker. Yeah, so in the book, I used the um, Harvard Museum of Natural History as a, um, I did a um, section, uh, the children's, um, children's edit. And that was suggested for, for the kids because um, some kids, for example, they don't like to go to big museums with lots of people. And that is a, that's a smaller museum and it might be more suitable for, uh, for younger children. Uh, Anne recommends the Paper House in Rockport. She yes. says it's amazing. Yes, that, that's, that's a drive by. Um, oh, you can also go in it. Again, very limited hours, um, but definitely off the beaten path. Not a destination, but if you're going to, for example, Halibut Point, if you want to go to that park where there's, there's a nice walk there as well uh, in, the, you know, in the rock quarries, um, the Paper Museum is a, is a good little stop and it is also in the book. And excuse my ignorance, but is the paper museum or the paper house, what, what, is that just in from, uh, the history of paper or what, what are we dealing no, with? No, no, it's a house someone built entirely of paper and it's no. varnished paper. Yes, wow, okay. it's an oddity. It's it's certainly one of those oddities, okay. um, but it is in the book. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Rosamond we try, says. We, we, we try to appeal to everybody. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't heard of that. Uh, Rosamond says that Lowell has a lovely cemetery that's great for walks and a bird watching. And there's also some whitewater rafting uh, around Lowell, which Rosamond, I had no idea about that. Yeah, but I, 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 yeah, go ahead. I had heard about the, you know, I, I, I cover the canal tours, National yes. Park Service again. Those are, um, those are wonderful. And I had heard about the, um, the, the, the White River rafting. Um, I do need to mention that um, I wrote this book last year, just at this time. And so it came out about a month ago. That's how long it takes to do it. Um, but I've already been told that this um, book is on a three year rewrite. And so that's two years from now. And so a lot of these suggestions I'll be using in the next edition. Excellent, that's great. So folks, if you have suggestions and I get them in, um, Let's see here, I'm gonna keep going. And, oh, by the way, uh, I did want to acknowledge, thank you for mentioning Miko Kaufman's uh, statue in Lowell. Oh, he, good. of course, is a Tewksbury native. He's a kind of one of our claims to fame here in Tewksbury. Oh, uh, he, yeah, he has several statues here in Tewksbury where he lived most of his life. And the Tewksbury Library actually on loan has a collection of a lot of his miniatures. Um, so if you, if you're, a, a, a you know, Miko Kaufman, an amazing sculptor, world renowned, did a lot of the, um, uh, presidential medals and presidential coins. Yes, I've heard that. Yeah. And so we have, uh, some of those, we have replicas of some of those on display at our library, along with, uh, miniatures of some of his, uh, sculptures. So it's definitely worth a, worth a, worth a visit if you're interested in Miko Kaufman. There you go. You're promoting Tewksbury. There we go. Uh, so Anne says the National Braille Press uh, may still give tours. They've given tours in the past, and I believe they're uh, based uh, in Northeastern University. Um, I Shelley know would, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shelley would like to know if you included the, the Beauport in Gloucester. Oh, the hotel. Yeah. Yes, actually, and I went. Um, and that's an interesting thing. Um, um, the hotel's only been open for five years and that actually changed going up to the North Shore and it has a hundred rooms. So it made it possible to um, go up to uh, Cape Ann in the off season. It really, it really changed tourism up there. So I, I, did, I did go there and it's lovely and the restaurant's got an amazing view. And then there's a historic house in uh, 
Gloucester that uh, is referred to as a, a, a Beauport. Um, uh, are you familiar with the the house, not the hotel, but the house? No, no. Okay, yeah, no. yeah. We, we did a program on that recently. That's another sort of uh, architectural marvel. Uh -huh. um, so Anne says the Russell Museum and the Ether Dome at Mass General Hospital. It's are in, both, it's, it's in, it is. Yeah, they're both very a interesting. Of, a lot of people are interested in that. Um, nurses and doctors, they like to make that kind of pilgrimage. It, it's a little hard to find. You right. really, um, and I tell you in the book to go to the information um, desk and they will give you um, a little card that shows you how to go through the hospital to get to it. Um, and you can see it anytime um, during business hours, unless they're giving a lecture I and mean, they still use it for, um, for lectures to the students and special presentations. Uh, Anne recommends the Olcott House in Concord. Um, they have wonderful tours oh, as yeah. does, uh, she also recommends Garden in the Woods. Yes. Um, Peg says, thank you for all this great information. I will have to get your book. Oh, so nice. Uh, Carleen recommends Maudsley State Park. In that's, 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 that's what I was talking about. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, also on Cape Ann, uh, Jean recommends Ravenwood, Ravenswood Park. That sounds like it's from Harry Potter, Jean. Yeah. Uh, so okay. Ravenswoods Park and the unusual Dogtown Common are very unique parks. Dogtown has huge boulders with sayings etched into them to lift up the spirits of the residents during the Great Depression. Yes, yes, I've heard about that. We'll probably go on the next one. That goes, um, that kind of skews to the more obscure. Um, um, but there's a place for that in the book as well. Um, I, I did want to, um, I, I did want to talk about one of the most fun things. I had forgot to mention this when I was writing the book. You know, the book was written to format. And so I had to I had to do a, a fact sheet, just like all the other books. And um, there was a section that was called uh, famous residents and famous people born in Massachusetts. And for the other books, it was very dull. But I wanted to read aloud um, what I had written because you've mentioned some of these names. Um, so famous people born in Massachusetts, you know, I'm going to write the people that you expect. So the founding fathers, of course, are here. But I went a little I went a little deeper. So we do Benjamin Franklin and Paul Revere and John Hancock, uh, President John Adams, President John Quincy Adams, Susan uh, B. Anthony, Edgar Allan Poe, Theodore Zeus Geisel, N.C. Wyatt, Betty Davis. And then we have President John F. Kennedy, Leonard Bernstein. President George H.W. Bush, Malcolm X, now we get to the fun part, Leonard Nimoy, Kurt Russell, Michael Bloomberg, Mike Wallace, Leslie Stahl, Matthew Perry, Matt LeBlanc, Uma Thurman, Amy Poehler, Mark Wahlberg, Conan O'Brien, Matt Damon, Ben was born in, um, in California, I had to look that up, Steve Carell, Chris Evans, John Krasinski, B.J. Novak, Mindy Kaling, obviously I'm a fan of The Office, but we, we wanted to, we wanted to zhuzh up Massachusetts. I mean, we're not New York and we're not California, but we, we have a, a lot of people are from here. Yeah, I think about half the office uh, comes from Massachusetts. <laughs> um, so we're gonna finish up with the chat, jump back to the Q&A and then we'll wrap things up. So Anne notes that um, there was a, there's a plastic museum in Lemonster and there used to be a museum of toilets in Worcester, but it closed. Yeah, that's closed. And yeah. I think the plastic museum I looked at as well. Some things had closed yeah. um, during COVID and have not opened up. Um, and so that was a little bit of a tricky thing as I was writing it last year when we weren't quite over COVID. And I kind of had to cast an eye as to, is, is it opening again? Has it opened? Will it close? Um, and I think for this book, unlike some of my other books, there are fewer restaurants for that reason. I definitely think in the next edition, there will be more restaurants because restaurants were the thing that were, that was really decimated in COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so in a couple of years, we'll see how, how it all it, it settles down. But um, that's, that's definitely been a change. I focus more on the places as opposed to the, the places to eat. Uh, so Angelina says this has been very informative. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy says that the Boatport Sleeper House in Gloucester is a, his national, a, a historic New England site. 
Uh, Valeria says uh, she recommends the Swamp Trail Nature Walk in Danvers. Oh. Uh, the, the Mass Audubon recommends it. Um, I think it's associated with the Ipswich River somehow. Uh, she says the birds used to eat the seeds out of your hand. I love Mass Audubon, and that was that's another thing we're talking about stewards of you know important places in Massachusetts, also Mass Audubon. Uh, so Rosamond says great program. Uh, I'm going to skip things that we've already covered. Um, Anne recommends the Scottish Scottish Rite Masons Museum in Lexington. Uh, Wright is R-I-T, Scottish Wright Masons Museum in Lexington. Judy says, thank you for this interesting talk. Virginia says, thanks very much. I will get your book and start exploring. Oh, good. Um, Jean uh, recommends the Museum of Bad Art in Dedham, says it's that's, very interesting. That's in. It's in. Yeah. Yeah, we've hosted them uh, virtually here in Tewksbury as well. And then I'm going to quickly jump back to the Q&A where I think we have some more questions and then we're going to wrap it up in about five minutes. Uh, so we're lightning round, Maria. Uh, cool. Francis wants to know, uh, did any bike paths make it into your book? Oh, yes, of course. Cape Cod Rail Trail is certainly in the book. They're, um, the, they're, I forget the name of the one that's in, that's in the Berkshires um, that's from Pittsfield, but that's in the book. There, there are quite a few bike trails, easy bike trails. Um, you know, I think I'm like a lot of people. I like um, soft adventure. So uh, there's a lot of soft adventure in, in, um, in the book. Uh, Christine asks, have you ever been to the Museum of Printing in Haverhill? It's a great museum. Uh, the staff is great and their combined experience make the visit worthwhile. Yeah, I'm not. It's not in the book, but certainly the next time. Uh, Annabelle says, do you think the, okay, so how strict were we with Massachusetts? Because Annabelle wants to know, do you think the National Park in Maine is close enough to include? No. I can't do that. I have to write to format. <laughs> Massachusetts only, Annabelle. And uh, can you just repeat the name of your book for Annabelle? Oh, uh, Massachusetts Off the Beaten Path. Yeah. And it just came out May 1st, was it? May, May 1st, yeah. A brand new it book. It came books. out on time. Just incredibly rare. <laughs> uh, Mary Jo recommends the Eric Carl Museum and the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst. Both are in the book. Uh, we have another uh, vote for the printing uh, Museum of Printing in Haverhill. John uh, notes the Plastic Museum in Lemonster is also closed. Okay. That's, that's what I thought. I had yeah. seen that. Um, you know, all these um, very specific museums, you know what's in here um, that actually has a lot of interest, I think, is the Spellman, Spellman Museum of Postal History. Regis College, about, right? It's, yeah, it's all about stamps. It's on the campus of Regis College in, in Weston. Yeah. And that is on, that is in the book. You know, I love the fact that about 70 to 75% of everything you mentioned, we've had programs with before. So that makes me feel like you're, I'm doing my job fairly you're well. You're doing but the right thing then. He's, he's retired now, but we used to host Henry Lucas, uh, who used to be the curator of the museum uh, for a yearly talk. Uh, Grace says, thank you. I look forward to seeing your future books. Joan wants to know, will this be available as a recording later? Uh, yes, it will, uh, Joan. Uh, I see that you missed the beginning, uh, yet you'll get it via email tomorrow. Uh, Frances says that she recommends the Cahoon Museum in, uh, oh, you, you're, 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 this is like a tough one for me. How do I pronounce that uh, city or town, Maria? Which one? you see one? that in the Q&A there? Oh. I I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing the museum correct. I the recommend the oh, top. Katuit. It's in Katuit. Katuit. Yeah, and that's on the Cape, mid Cape. Okay. Well, I, uh, thought, I thought Francis was trying to trick me. Uh, have you ever been to the Cahoon Museum in Katuit? No, I have not. Okay. I have not, but I do like Katuit. That would be worth. That would be worth going there for. There we go. All right. One of those folks... Indian, it's one of those Indian names. Oh, is it? Oh, well, I apologize then. I, uh, I, 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 I pronounce uh, people's names incorrectly, as you know, Maria. So I especially, especially struggle with uh, cities and towns. All right. So we are uh, just about at eight o'clock. 
Um, let's give Maria one big last virtual round of applause. Uh, folks, look for an email from me tomorrow with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, information about some other upcoming virtual programs that might be of interest. There'll also be a link to purchase a copy of Maria's book from Wellesley Books, uh, Wellesley Bookstore, which was our official uh, bookstore partner. I will also, in the email, uh, personally thank all the partnering libraries who helped Chooksbury spread the word. And there'll also be information about some other upcoming virtual programs that might be of interest. Whew. All right, so Maria, right. I think we did it. Do you have any last words before we wrap it up? I hope you all travel in Massachusetts. It's just a wonderful state. All right, and if I'm not mistaken, the first day of summer, I believe is tomorrow. So I think yes. I timed this just right, folks. So you have uh, a bunch of places to, uh, to visit. And, uh, you know, uh, feel free to go out and uh, purchase a copy of Maria's book, but no pressure, no obligation. Uh, and you, you, know, can, you, you can get in the library, most well, libraries. You stole my line, Maria. That's where I was going next. So uh, check your check your local public library, check your uh, library consortium. And if they don't own the book, then encourage the library to purchase a copy. So uh, we'll end it there. Uh, thank you so much, Maria. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. And Maria, go Red Sox. <laughs> there you go. Thanks. Right. Bye. Bye-bye.